Okay, yes, it's an aggressive title, so I want to back up a little bit and start by saying that Vancouver's waterfront is perhaps one of the most celebrated waterfronts in the world. It's an epic 28-kilometer path called the Seawall that stretches around the downtown peninsula all the way to Kitsilano. If you ask most residents, they'll probably tell you that it's the crown jewel of the city or something. In fact, this kind of waterfront is becoming more and more popular in cities around the world. Just take a look at Dubai's marina. Even the railings look similar. Perhaps your city has something like this too, a nice walking path by the sea. But I want to make the case to you that waterfronts like this are actually a bit problematic. If you ever stop and think about it, like literally try stopping and thinking on the seawall, you might find it a bit awkward. This waterfront isn't meant for much other than walking. There's walking by yourself, walking with a friend, walking with a dog, but it's all just walking. Well, there's cycling too, but you get the point. With a few exceptions like Granville Island and the Convention Center, most of Vancouver's seawall is dedicated to a path which has a ton of parks, maybe a handful of restaurants, but not much else. And a lot of it is frankly underused. Case in point, Cultural Harmony Grove Park, a patch of grass with trees with a few benches. I guess one way to create cultural harmony is to make a park so boring everyone agrees not to use it. And then there's this park that's literally called Existential Alley. I think the name speaks for itself. I could point to countless other examples. The Vancouver seawall is kind of boring. When I see all these unused spaces in some of the most prime real estate in Vancouver, I can't help but think that there's a missed opportunity here. Other city waterfronts frankly make Vancouver's look like a snooze fest. Just look at Porto's Riverside restaurants, Thailand's floating markets, Oslo's waterfront pools, and Coney Island's beachside amusement park and general chaos. But one of my favorite examples is actually here in Canada, the Halifax waterfront. It has businesses, buskers, restaurants, concerts, a two-story beer garden, and so much more right next to the harbor. These waterfronts are more than just places to break in your latest pair of yoga pants. They're places where you feel like the whole community is coming together. You can really see the difference between Halifax's waterfront and Vancouver's seawall at night. At 9.30 p.m., Halifax's boardwalk is still bustling. This is clearly a destination at all times of the day. But Vancouver's seawall at 9.30 p.m. is basically shut down. It's like the city doesn't want anyone to be out here after sunset. There's no lighting and very few people. It's a no man's land. So why isn't Vancouver's waterfront more like Halifax? Well, at first I thought the answer was obvious. You know, as Vancouverites, always obsessed about staying fit and healthy, maybe this is the waterfront you create if you want to look good in spandex. But that's not actually the reason. You can still have a great walking and jogging path while also having businesses, restaurants, and other attractions by the water. The two are quite compatible. The real reason why Vancouver's waterfront is so empty is actually something a bit more political. People in Vancouver have actually tried to change parts of the waterfront before. In 2001, while Cole Harbor was under construction, the BC Restaurant Association proposed turning it into a mecca for fun and food. But their proposed plan was ultimately rejected by the local government. The result? Yeah, a walking path by the sea. In 2002, the Vancouver Park Board set out to develop this restaurant next to Kitts Beach. And the result? raucous public meetings, a petition against the development, and a lawsuit that went all the way to the BC Supreme Court. Why would people hate restaurants so much? Well, a reporter covering the backlash at the time wrote that the opponents believed it would despoil a magical beach, lead to beer swilling in the public place, cause light and noise pollution, and increase traffic congestion. You see, some very vocal people, especially those who live next to the seawall, actually don't want it to become too busy. In fact, there's a long history of people opposing all kinds of activities on the seawall. For example, bikes. 
yeah, it might be hard to believe now, but in the 1970s, cycling on the seawall was made illegal. In one year, police handed out over 3,000 tickets to these two-wheeled criminals. One park board commissioner even wanted to start ticketing joggers. Another example, volleyball. In the early 2000s, plans were made to create a set of volleyball courts here in the grass next to Sunset Beach in Vancouver's West End. What's not to love about that? Well, of course, nearby residents protested that too. Their concerns included noise, more competition for parking, and dust. Their preference, a more passive and ecologically sound park environment. The courts were never built. I think a writer for the Globe and Mail in 1980 described it best. Thousands of citizens living in apartments in the city's west end regard the park as their private backyard. But as much as I'd love to blame this all on the NIMBYs, that's not the only thing at play here. The more I learned about this issue, the more I realized that there's actually a very pervasive ideology to blame as well. One that has shaped cities all across the world for centuries. It turns out there's a lot of park planners and policymakers who actually want public spaces with not much else to do other than walking. And to understand why, we have to go back in history. I want to quickly take a break here to thank Urbanarium. They're a nonprofit organization that works to educate and engage the public on urban planning issues. I actually got the original inspiration for this story after attending one of their city debates called Commercialize the Seawall. You can watch a full recording of that debate on their website. All right, now back to the video. The oldest part of Vancouver's seawall is the section around Stanley Park, which was built in 1918. The city had recently established the park after destroying the indigenous village of Hoi Hoi, as well as other communities, stealing the land from people who had lived there for thousands of years. And they were running into a problem. The park was being eroded into the ocean. So a decision was made to build a wall around the park to protect it. Then this guy was like, wouldn't it be cool if it was also a walking path? And the first part of the seawall was built. But this walking path wasn't just a neat idea, it was part of a larger movement. At the time, people were pretty desperate to get out of cities. This was in the aftermath of the Industrial Revolution, where many cities were often polluted and noisy. That led to a design movement. In the 19th century, planners like Frederick Olmsted began designing urban parks specifically to help people escape from the city into nature. He once wrote, The enjoyment of scenery employs the mind without fatigue and yet exercises it, tranquilizes it and yet enlivens it. One of his most significant projects was arguably New York Central Park, 843 acres of landscape gardens with sprawling walking paths. This park and others like it had a huge influence on the design of public spaces all over the world. And soon, most cities had a version of their own. The formula? Take a large chunk of land, fill it with lawns and gardens, connect them with walking paths, maybe sprinkle in a questionable monument or two that will probably have to be taken down later, and voila, you have your escape from the city. Vancouver was no exception to this trend, but its own twist on the concept was the seawall. This walking path overlooking the ocean was designed for citizens here to escape from the city into nature. People loved it, and this built the political will and expectation to continue the seawall all along the waterfront. At the time, the rest of Vancouver's waterfront was mostly industrial, but in the latter half of the 20th century, these areas gradually redeveloped, creating neighborhoods like Falls Creek South, Yale Town, and Olympic Village. As these lands redeveloped, the public looked to the success of the Stanley Park seawall as inspiration for what should go into these new developments, which was, you guessed it, a walking path. But that wasn't the only force at play here. For developers, the most profitable thing to build next to this walking path weren't businesses or restaurants, but luxury townhouse apartments. So that is what ended up being built, row after row of multi-million dollar waterfront residences. Today, that has led to a distinctly quiet and non-commercial waterfront in Vancouver. We have a 28 kilometer waterfront path that mostly consists of parks and luxury housing. Now, I'm not here to tell you that one kind of waterfront is better than another. Ultimately, the best use of public space is a very nuanced issue. In some places, there probably is still a very fair argument for creating a refuge from pollution and noise, just like the 1800s. But in other places, that might not be the best use of public land. In Vancouver, we have some of the best air quality in the world, but the city does have a well-documented loneliness problem. At the end of the day, this is a subjective question that differs for each person. What is the best way to use these spaces? And what societal needs do we want them to fill? 
But increasingly, I don't think we're asking these questions at all. In cities like Vancouver and across the world, this walking path by the sea formula has become, well, a formula. A cookie cutter idea that gets plopped into a waterfront regardless of context or the needs of people living there. At best, it's a safe and inoffensive idea. At the end of the day, a city's waterfront is a very important, defining feature of a place. And it's worth thinking critically about what we want that space to look like. Maybe we could try thinking outside of the path. Yeah, hey, running in bag. She used to tell me a little ice snack. Yeah, running in bag. These motherfuckers are wanting to crack. Yeah, running in bag. She wanna say, want that. Nah, running in bag. I got my wish and I'm breaking my back. Yeah, running in bag.